The Lord be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Father. Through the years as a priest, I've made several friends who would go on to become federal judges. And when I converse with these men and one woman, uh, Irene Keeley, who's a judge, federal judge in Clarksburg, I'm amazed at the amount of power and authority they have, especially in their courtrooms. They rank supreme. I also remember a number of years ago, getting into a rather heated debate, we'll call it, with a young attorney who was rather full of himself. And basically what had happened, uh, this young attorney uh, had been baptized and confirmed as a Catholic. He went on to study at a Jesuit college and then would go on to the seminary to study for the Jesuits. And then he left uh, before he got ordained and became in his own words, an agnostic. Well, what set the stage for this conversation that we had was his fiance was about to convert to Catholicism and she was in the RCIA class. And he was doing everything he could to dissuade her from becoming Catholic. And so we met up in this pub one night, not too far from the church, and got into this debate about God, and he was throwing all the familiar garbage at me. You know, if God exists, why do so many people suffer? Why is there so much poverty in the world? And so on and so on. And when I realized I was kind of knocking on an iron block, uh, there was no way of getting to this guy, it just stopped. Well, she ended up becoming Catholic, and she dumped him before they got married. But at any rate, several years after this conversation of sorts, I was sitting down in uh, the courtroom in the Southern Federal District Court of West Virginia in Charleston. Uh, I had been invited to attend that experience of investing uh, of new attorneys into that court by a young woman who I helped get through law school. Uh, I tutored her in philosophy. And um, so it was quite an honor to get to see her get invested in the Southern District of West Virginia. And I remember going into this courtroom and I was, had to stand in the back, the, the courtroom was packed and we were probably four, six deep, rows of people. It was how packed the courtroom was. And I'll never forget when the judge entered his, his courtroom and the bench, it was a dear friend of mine, Judge Fred Stamp, who's now retired. He'd been the judge in the Northern District of West Virginia for a number of years. A very nice man. But what amazed me, when he entered the room, the people who were seated were mostly attorneys. They snapped to attention like Marines. For goodness gracious, they stood up. And then when Judge Stamp said, sit down, they sat down just like good, obedient kindergartners. And it was just amazing 
how they were giving deference and showing reverence for the authority of Judge Stamp. And as I say, these judges really do wield a lot of power and authority. Well, at one point, I'm panning the courtroom to see if there was anyone I knew there other than the couple people from Wheeling. And lo and behold, there was that attorney bowing and stooping like all the rest of them. And I thought to myself, what hypocrisy. You'll bend the knee before a federal judge, but you won't bend the knee before Jesus Christ, the divine judge. I just found that reprehensible. Well, a few years ago, a dear friend of mine who's practiced law for years, John Bailey, was appointed by President Bush to be the federal judge of the Northern District of West Virginia. And on the day that he received his letter of confirmation, I was actually heading to St. Stephen's to do an evening mass. And he called me on my cell phone and he told me about what had happened. And of course, I congratulated him. I said, John, you got that because you worked very hard. And he said, Father Jim, do you know the difference between God and a federal judge? I said, no. But I said, I bet you you do. He said, God doesn't think he's a federal judge. <laughs> and that brings us to our gospel for today, believe it or not. We have a passage here from Matthew chapter 16 that is paralleled in Luke 9 and Mark chapter 8. John knows nothing about this story. And while the storyline is identical, there are few details that are different. For instance, as the story opens up, we're told that Jesus makes a pit stop at a town called Caesarea Philippi. Both Mark and Matthew name the place as such. Luke does not name it at all. But Caesarea Philippi was a significant point in the gospel. The name Caesarea Philippi comes from actually two Latin root words. You see, Caesarea Philippi had been an old Roman fortress town. And it was named after Julius Caesar, hence the Caesarea, and Philip, the brother of King Herod, who was the tetrarch, the leader of the area around Caesarea Philippi, hence the name Philip or Philippi, Caesarea Philippi. But what's important about this location is that symbolically in the Gospels, it's the halfway point of Jesus' public ministry, which began up north in the region of Galilee and is destined to conclude in the province of Judea. Where, Ju where Jerusalem is located. And so at one point abruptly, Jesus stops and he turns to the disciples and he says, who do people say that I am? And they start rattling off a number of different names. Uh, some say you're John the Baptist, they say. Some say you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Where did they get all these names? The Jewish people were unified in believing that a Messiah was going to come. But who that Messiah would be, and what kind of Messiah that would be, depended on your social circles, your geographic location, and so on. Some people did believe that John the Baptist, who had been beheaded by King Herod, would come back to life and usher in the kingdom of God as the Messiah. Some people, many Jews, even many Jews today, believe that Elijah the prophet was going to come. And their, their belief in Elijah was because in 2 Kings, Elijah never dies. He's taken up to the heavens in a fiery chariot. And the Jews to this day believe that Elijah's going to come back. Uh, some people thought that Moses was going to come back from the grave. He would go up on the mountaintop and get a whole new set of commandments that would be so persuasive that people would finally obey God and the kingdom would come. And some people thought David would come back from the dead, the great King David. He would rouse up a mighty army that would expel the Romans physically from the area of Judea and the kingdom of God would come. 
And so why do they attach all these titles to Jesus? Because Jesus is acting like a Messiah at this point. He's performed powerful miracles. He's spoken authoritatively about the kingdom of God. He has referred to God as his Abba, his father, his daddy. And so people like what they see. But then notice what Jesus does next. He looks Peter squarely in the eyes and says, who do you say that I am? And Peter utters a solemn title for Jesus. You are the Messiah, he says, the son of the living God. Where did Peter get this? Well, Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon. No human being has revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. This came from God, Peter, not your own intellect. And then look what Jesus does to Peter. He says to Peter, You are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. What does he say? exactly what you hear. Peter is to be the rock-solid solid foundation of the church after Jesus' death and resurrection. And look what authority and power he bestows upon Peter. He says, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That's a symbolic way of saying, you got the power. You're going to have all the power here on earth. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Peter, if you forgive the repentant sinner, they'll be forgiven in heaven. If you do not forgive the repentant sinner because he does not repent, then neither will they be forgiven in heaven. That's an incredible amount of authority given to a human being. And then he does something that has caused people for centuries to scratch their heads. He tells Peter and the rest of them, shh, say nothing to anyone. Why? Well, we find Jesus do this a lot in Mark's gospel. He will do it some in Matthew's gospel, rarely in Luke's gospel, only a couple of times, but he never does it in John. But here's the reason for the secret. As I shared with you previously, up to this point, the disciples have seen nothing but power and authority out of Jesus. They've seen what they know has to be the Messiah, but they've only seen one side of the coin. The other side of the coin will not come until the end of the gospel. When the Messiah will carry a piece of wood, heavy wood, up a hill called Calvary, and where he will die a agonizing and humiliating death for his people. That is the brother side of the coin of the Messiah. And you know what? They couldn't handle it. The disciples fled like cowards when Jesus was arrested. None of them had the loyalty or the decency to stand by him at the foot of the cross. They all fled like cowards. The cross was a huge scandal for them. You see their problem? They didn't spend enough time listening to what Jesus said when he forecasted that was going to happen. They only wanted to hear the good time stuff, the victorious stuff. But for Jesus, the true victory, the ultimate victory, came in the midst of suffering, then his true glory would be revealed on Calvary and on Easter Sunday. What's the point of this passage for us? Well, first of all, as Catholics, this passage serves as the foundation text for our belief in what we call the Petrine ministry, the papacy as it's called today. It's actually appropriately called the Petrine ministry, or the ministry of Peter. But you know what? Most Christians who are not Catholics have a terrible time in accepting this teaching of Jesus Christ himself. And it amazes me on one hand because they believe the Bible, especially the fundamentalists, is, is to be taken literally word for word. 
Well, what about these words? What was the problem with this passage for the reformers in the 16th century? And actually the same arguments that they put forth against this passage, Protestant theologians today maintain. Here are their arguments. First of all, they will tell you that it couldn't have been Peter to be the leader of the church after Jesus died. Why? Because Peter was a sinner. He was a terrible sinner. He was human, not divine. But you've got to remember, when you look at Protestant teaching, and it's important to realize the teaching of the Reformers, they saw the human person as horribly sinful and corrupt. In fact, we were conceived in sin, we were born in sin, and as long as we got air in our lungs, we are sinners. Only by the grace of God, only by the grace of God, could a few of us possibly be saved. That's what the reformers believed to a man. That's what they taught. And so when you try to give Peter a special place in the whole realm of things, they'll tell you he was just like any other human being, corrupt, evil, a sinner. The second argument is Jesus, when he's talking about Peter, when he calls Peter a rock, he's not calling Peter a rock, He's actually referring to himself, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the rock of the church. And let's face it, he is the foundation of the church. But the scriptures are very clear. And what amazes me is some of the finest Protestant scholars in the world still maintain that the reading, the translation is not accurate based on what the Lord is saying. But I'm here to tell you as someone who reads and knows Aramaic, the teaching, the language that Jesus spoke, the word kephas is translated rock unconditionally, period. And that's what the text says. You can twist it any way you want, but when Jesus said rock to Peter, you are rock, he meant Peter, pure and simple. Some will argue that, well, he wasn't really referring to Peter as the rock or even himself as the rock. He was referring to Peter's faith as the rock. Once again, that is a skewing of sacred scripture. Take the scripture at its word, literally, because Jesus does not mince his words. And if he wanted to say to Peter, it's your faith that's going to be the rock, Jesus would have said it for goodness sake. No, as sinful as Peter was, as, 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 as very weak as Peter was, Jesus called him a rock. And whenever a name is changed of a person in Bible studies, that means that person's mission has changed. And Peter, Peter will emerge as the leader of the Twelve he will die in Rome, and from that point, on the rock that Jesus formed in Peter, other men throughout history have succeeded. The second point, and perhaps the most important point, this will shock you. Hold on to your chest, your pacemaker, whatever you got going on. Never, ever in the New Testament, did Jesus ever say, I am Christ? Never did he say, I am God. Never did he say, I am Lord. Never did he say, I am the Son of God. I know some of you are looking at me very puzzled. We just presume that he said that of himself. But search the scriptures as you will. You'll never find that happening. The closest we get to the title Christ is the words we find in John's Gospel when Pilate is interrogating Jesus. At one point he looks in Jesus and says, are you the Christ? You remember Jesus' response? You're the one who said so. You're the one. Pilate said it, but Jesus did. So what does Christ, Lord, God, Son of God, what does all this mean? 
They are titles for Jesus. They are not proper names for Jesus. Jesus Christ is not his proper name. His proper name is Jesus. His title is Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, you see. Well, where did these titles come from? From the apostles, from the early church. The early church, in reflecting upon the word of God and what Jesus meant for them, chose to call him certain titles. But here's the catch for us. There is a functional relationship, as I call it, between the titles we use for Jesus and what we say about ourselves. So in other words, if I call Jesus a title, I am saying something about myself. And here's how it works. Probably the most common title used for Jesus is Lord. We use it all the time. We use it at Mass all the time. We refer Jesus as Lord, and so he is, for sure. But look what the word Lord meant in ancient times. Caesar was called Lord. A Roman general would be called Lord by his troops. A great philosopher was called Lord by his students. And wealthy landowners who owned a lot of property were called Lord by their servants. And what that means is this. When the title Lord was given to one of these human beings, it meant that their way, their agenda, their rule governed the life of the servant. The servant was expected to act with immediacy whenever the Lord gave a command. There was never to be questioning of that command. You were to hear it, accept it, and act on it. Period. Done. What about we who call Jesus Lord? Do we see him as our Lord? Is Jesus the ultimate authority in our lives? Is his agenda our agenda? to the letter of his command. More often than not, we will use the name Lord for him, the title, but we don't necessarily always follow his way completely. And one test case is Matthew 18. When the Lord says to his disciples, how many times must you forgive? Not seven times, but 70 times seven times. How many of us have heard that command, thought about someone who has harmed us in this life, and then said to the Lord in response, yes, sir, I will carry out your command. Perhaps we question that command, or perhaps we blow it off altogether. I listened to a sister give a talk one time, and she said, you know what? We use titles for Jesus too loosely at times. We need to stop and think about what we're saying before we call him the Lord, before we call him Master, before we call him God or Christ. We need to stop for a moment and think, if I call him my Lord, am I willing to allow him to have total authority over my life? And then she said to the gathering, if not, maybe I need simply to keep my lips closed. So my brothers and sisters, it's a real challenge. The mosses have come to baptize their little baby into the faith of Jesus Christ. At this baptism, you are saying, Jesus is my Lord and my baby is going to be his servant. Is that what you really mean? Because that's what it's all about. So let us pray in a very special way for the mosses for Olivia, but for all of us. May we who dare call Jesus our Lord act as his humble, loyal, and faithful servants.